Good morning. Welcome to Grace Church. Uh, whether this is your first time or you're a regular attender, a member here, we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us here today. Um, Grace Church, something you've probably heard about us is that we are a gospel-shaped community that leads people to follow Jesus in all of life. And that is basically breaking down to we want our relationship with Jesus. We want our understanding of the gospel, the fact that Jesus came, the fact that our, our sin separated us from God, but Jesus lived the perfect life that we couldn't live so that we could be reconciled with him. We want that fact to impact our lives throughout the week, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, throughout the whole week, uh, and this is, this is a time for us to worship together on Sunday. And so whether you're here in person or online, we're really excited that you're here, excited to worship together today. Uh, I have just one announcement, and that is uh, I want to remind everyone about our missional communities. If you are not in a missional community already, I would highly encourage you to check out how to learn more about those and join one. You can do that on our website. Uh, if you go to the top right-hand corner, Click on the, the drop-down menu and then click on Grow. There is a section in there about missional communities. You can learn about them. You can hear where we have missional communities throughout the city. And also there's a link to, to join uh, and have a conversation about that. And so um, I'm going to now take some time to open us in prayer before we dive into our worship time together. God, you are a good and loving and generous Father. Thank you that, um, that you know us, that you know us intimately, that you, that you know each person in this room and that you care for us intimately. And that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of yours, you sent your son Jesus to die in our place so that we could become friends of God, so that we could become reconciled sons and daughters of the Most High King. We're so grateful for that. Pray that as that truth impacts our hearts, that you would grow in us the fruits of your Spirit, God, that you would grow in us the love that you have, and that you would allow us to pour out that love, that peace, that patience, that goodness, kindness towards the people around us, towards our city. God, I pray that you would use each of us, God, as, as a community of faith to impact your kingdom in the city and around the world, God. Thank you that you choose to use your people in the lives of the people around us, God, in our, our, the lives of our neighbors, our friends, our families, our co-workers, and even to encourage and love and support each other as a community of faith, God. I do today want to specifically ask your, your mercy and your grace on the nation of India. God, as we've, as we've seen throughout the past weeks, um, just the devastation that COVID-19 is, is wreaking in, in India, God, the, the families that many of us even know personally who are being impacted in India, God, just ask for Oh, yeah, your, your grace and your mercy to, to prevent the spread, to, to heal, to bring life and healing. Um, I, I do just ask God for people to, to follow the social distancing rules and wearing masks, God, and, and, and just pray for uh, scientists and, and medical professionals to be wise and to be able to, to bring vaccines and, and things that are going to be healing people, God. Just, just ask for that. Ask for your mercy, God, we, we ask for churches in India that you would use them during this time to be your light in the way that they love people, in the way that they care for people, in the way that they serve and love the communities around them. God, pray that you would use COVID-19, you would use the awful things that are happening to bring about good in people's lives that you would bring people to faith in you um, and that you would use your church in India to serve and to love and to, to be your light so that people can come to know you and that you would be glorified. God, we ask for 
the families of people who have lost loved ones, God. We ask for your grace and your peace to be present in their lives, that you would comfort them, that you would give them eternal perspective, God. And when we don't understand what's going on, as I don't understand it, we don't understand it, God, but we know that you are sovereign, we know that you are in control, and we know that you are good. And so we ask that you would use these situations for good and use them for your glory, even when we don't understand what's going on around us, God. Pray that you would grow us together as a church uh, and, and show us the role that we can play in supporting, in loving, and yeah, just serving our neighbor in this time, God. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you that the truth of the gospel means that separation from you, eternal separation from you, does not have to be the end for us in our lives or the people around us, God, but that we can live life full of your spirit and in your presence eternally, God. And we thank you for that truth. And it's in your name we pray it. Amen. I'm going to ask Yannick now to come up and read our psalm for the morning. Um, from the ESV, a mick time of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge, till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. Selah. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O oh harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O oh God above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Well, good morning, church. My name is Corey, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm so thankful that today you've chosen to worship with us. And that this morning, I get the opportunity to open God's word and teach this morning. So if you would, if you have your Bibles, you can open to Philippians chapter four. We're gonna look at verses four through nine this morning. Philippians chapter four, verses four through nine. Uh, we're actually in a new series here at Grace Church that passed actually three or four weeks on the fruit of the spirit. And that might be a new term to you, it might not be, but if you were here or watched online our introduction to this series, we looked at a passage in a different book of the Bible called Galatians, in chapter five, that talks about this list of things called the fruit of the Spirit. And what we talked about is that the writer of that book, Paul, is describing what it looks like for Christians to walk in the freedom that they've been given through Jesus Christ. He tells them what freedom doesn't look like, but then he describes, if you know Jesus and the Spirit of God is in you, these are the things that will be produced in you, and this is what it looks like to walk in freedom. In a minute, I'm gonna read that list from Galatians chapter five before we look at our particular word from that list today. But we also answered a couple of questions in week one that are helpful for us to remember as we carry through this entire series. The first was this, how do these things I'm about to read, how do they happen in our life? 
How is it that they come about? And we said it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only by God's power through God's spirit that these things are possible in us, that we can be empowered to live these things out in our life. And it's also possible because of the provision of the spirit, that all the things I'm about to read from this list that describes the fruit of the spirit, all of these are things that have been given to or done towards us by God himself. These are not things we have to invent on our own or just come up with in and of ourselves. They have been things given to us, gifts demonstrated towards us by God. So then we ask this question as well, what is our role in this whole process? In seeing this fruit of the spirit, of God's spirit coming out of us, of walking practically in the freedom that we have in Christ, what is our role? And Galatians told us it's to participate in the process not because God needs us to do it. It's his power alone that brings these things about. It's his gifts that he gives to us and then teaches us how to walk in them. And as his people, as his children, if you are a Christian, God will over time develop these things in you. But the question is, how do you want that process to go? Do you want to participate with God in the work he is doing? And as you do that, you see God, this is such a good thing you are doing in me that's of you, from you, making me more like you. And God, as I align myself with what you're doing in participation, I have the experience of goodness and joy in you cultivating these things in and through me. Or do you want to have the other version, the kicking and screaming version? The, because God loves us, he will develop these things in us because he loves us too much to leave us in our sinful, selfish ways. But along the way, do we want to be going, I don't want it, God, stop doing it, I'm resisting this. That's a totally different process, isn't it? That's not one that we would enjoy near as much. So our role is not to be the power in this process, not to provide what's needed in this process, but simply to participate in it so that we can enjoy the work that God does in and through us. So I'm gonna read Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. This is the list that describes the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The last two weeks, we've looked at the first two words in that list, love and joy. And today we're gonna look at peace. I want you to think this morning of someone that you know you would say, as I observe this person, it seems that they have peace in their life. No matter how you define peace or how you've come to that conclusion, I think there's a thread that would be similar in all of our stories as we think about someone, we would say, yeah, I think they have peace in their life. You didn't come to that conclusion by only seeing them in situations where there was not struggle or difficulty. My guess is the way you observed or came to believe that they had peace is you saw them in a difficult or trying situation and said, ah, but even then it seems like they had peace in their life. As we look at this passage today in Philippians chapter four and talk about the idea of biblical peace, the writer of this passage, the apostle Paul, actually affirms this idea that peace is possible even within the most trying of circumstances. Paul affirms this to be true and also gives us insight into how it's possible to have the peace of God even in the most difficult of situations. Let's read Philippians chapter four and verses four through nine this morning. Philippians four verses four through nine says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace 
will be with you. In this passage, it's important for us before we start to have just kind of a working definition of what peace is from a biblical perspective before we look at what Paul says about it. This definition will actually be very similar to the one we used last week for joy. But our working definition today for peace as we look at Philippians 4 is this. Peace is a God-focused and God-sustained calmness of the soul. Peace is a God-focused and God-sustained calmness of the soul. And Paul tells us in these verses in Philippians 4, to live in this kind of peace, we need to know a few things. And Paul tells us these things in Philippians 4. First of all, in verse 4, we see this, number one today, peace requires partners. Peace requires partners. We've mentioned this before in regard to the fruit of the Spirit, that list of things I read from Galatians 5, that although they, those are distinct things, right? Love is different than joy. Joy is different than peace. They're inseparable. We can't know and grow in one of them without also knowing and growing in the others as well. It's not a buffet style of things where we can say, I'll grow in that and that and that, and I'll leave the other ones out because I don't really like those. It's all of them working together to produce the fruit singular, the singular fruit of the Spirit in the lives of believers. And we see this in this particular passage very obviously, that there are, there's a distinction between these things in the list in Galatians 5, but they require partners because they're inseparable from the other things that we read there about the fruit of the Spirit. In Philippians 4, there are two main sections of this passage, and each of them end with the idea of peace. But leading up to the conclusion of this idea of peace, we see other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit being mentioned. Very prominently in verse 4, Paul begins with joy. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. He says, and I'll say it again, rejoice. He repeats himself in that first verse in verse 4. The result of what Paul is writing about in these sections is peace, but he starts with talking about joy. Why? Because joy is a partner to peace. It's also important for us to know the context that this passage is written into. Paul is writing these words about joy and peace as he sits in prison for preaching the gospel. Notice what he doesn't say here. He does not say, be joyful about the circumstances that you're in. He says, rejoice in the Lord. The Lord that is still his Lord, even in, as he sits in the circumstance of his imprisonment. Last week, we looked at joy in Psalm 16 and all the reasons that David gave for delighting in, finding joy in, rejoicing. And it all came from who God was and what God had done and would do towards him. His joy was not in his circumstances. His joy was in the Lord. I want you to think about this this morning. Do you believe that you have the peace of God in your life? Or maybe you might ask the question, do you want the peace of God in your life? I would ask you this, when is the last time that you rejoiced in God? When is the last time that you looked upon the Lord that you might find joy the people that Paul is writing to even had a bit of conflict between them and they were also experiencing troubling circumstances. But Paul wants them to experience peace, but he knows to help them understand how to walk in this peace, he needs to remind them of a partner to peace, which is rejoicing. Not rejoicing in circumstances, but rejoicing in the God who is greater than the circumstances that you're currently in. Paul says, if you want to know peace, if you want to walk in peace, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And I'm going to say it again, rejoice. Look upon your God, Christian. Look upon your Savior. Look at all of who he is and what he has done towards you. Delight and rejoice in that because that is a necessary component and partner to you experiencing the peace of God in your life. But number two today, peace requires perspective. We see this in verse number five in Philippians chapter four. Here it says in verse number five, it says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. 
Paul then moves on and says, let's let your reasonableness be known. And this word reasonable can be translated as reasonable, meaning open to reason or gentleness. The big idea with this word, and maybe there isn't a perfect English word to use here. The big idea is being appropriate, fair, mild, and gentle. All of that is wrapped up into what he's saying when he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Why would Paul talk about this? And what does it have to do with peace? Let's think about what would be the opposite of being appropriate, fair, mild, and gentle. It would be someone who's improper, unfair, biased, and harsh. Does that list of words sound like someone who is experiencing or walking in peace? No. Does does that person seem to be having a calmness in their soul? He would say, No. But how can Paul, who is unjustly sitting there in prison as he writes this, be saying that we should all be appropriate, fair, mild, and gentle? Think about the situation that he's in, and yet that's what he's calling all of us to as he unjustly sits in prison for preaching the gospel. And how does Paul then lead us into experiencing peace by talking about this reasonableness. It's because of the perspective that Paul had and calls us to have and its connection to our reasonableness and to our experiencing of God's peace. The next phrase he says is, the Lord is at hand. Paul says the reason that you should be and can be appropriate, fair, mild, and gentle in all circumstances is because your Lord and Savior is going to return. He's at hand. Christ has said that he will come back. Paul is saying that acting this way that he is calling us to in this reasonableness makes perfect sense if you actually believe that Jesus will return. Why? Because when he returns, he will judge and deal with all the injustice that we have experienced. He will set all things right when he returns. When he returns, these present circumstances of injustice, hardship, and suffering will no longer be. Instead, for the people of God, things will eternally be good and right and perfect, as they should be. That was Paul's belief. That was Paul's perspective. One which he said, if you believe that, then it's totally reasonable and appropriate to be sitting in prison And yet talk about being appropriate, fair, mild, and gentle. Because I don't have to be this other kind of person trying to get what I need for myself in this moment, what I want in this moment, finding peace for myself in this moment when injustice has been done towards me. He says, no, I can be reasonable. I can do that. Why? Because the Lord's at hand. This is not the end of how this story goes. Therefore, it's Perfectly reasonable, even expected that as a follower of Christ, this is how I would live even in troubling circumstances. Paul is leading to this conclusion of peace and says, rejoice in who God is. Be reasonable because you know Jesus will come back and set all things right. But before he explicitly mentions peace, he has one more thing to say. Brings us to point number three this morning. Peace requires prayer. See this in verse six. He says, do not be anxious about anything. The word anxious here means feeling or showing worry, nervousness, or unease about something with an uncertain outcome. It's interesting where Paul positions this idea in this particular passage. It comes after he reminds us to rejoice in God. It comes after a call for reasonableness because we know that Christ will return and set all things right. After that is when he says, don't worry, be nervous or uneasy about the things that seem uncertain to you. That's when he brings that up. Paul knows that as we look at this world around us, we can find plenty of things that seemingly disrupt a calmness in our soul. Plenty of things that can incite worry, nervousness, uneasiness, because from our seat, From our view, we don't know how this is going to turn out. But Paul is building a case here. He says the reason you can have peace, a calmness in your soul, has nothing to do with your present circumstances. 
the reason you can be at peace instead of anxious is because of who God is, what God has done, and what you know he's going to do. Rejoice, know the Lord is at hand. That's why you can put off anxiousness. But even as Christians rejoice in God and have the proper perspective on our coming future of Christ's return, it's still hard to not be anxious, right? It's still hard to walk in peace that Paul's getting to in this passage. That's why he writes the next section here where he says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul is known for an idea throughout his writings. It's an idea of putting off and then putting on. He says to put off anxiousness, but tells us what to do instead. It's not just stop being anxious. He says, put this off, but then put this on in its place. He says, in its place, put prayer. How should we pray? Well, Paul tells us. He says three things. He says, pray in everything, pray humbly asking, and pray with thanksgiving. He says, pray in everything. There is nothing too big or too small to bring to our God in prayer as our hearts are feeling anxious and at lack of calmness in our soul, God says, how do you put off the anxiousness? Well, you turn away from dwelling on the anxiety of this uncertain outcome and come talk to me. Come tell me what you are experiencing in this moment of anxiety. Pray in every and any situation. But he says, also pray with supplication. That means humbly asking. Pray asking God for what you righteously desire. For this, for Paul, that may have looked like praying that he would be released from prison. God says, let your requests be made known to him. We prayed this morning for India and how the effects of the pandemic are happening there. Do we know the outcome of what's going to happen in that situation? No, but what are we doing? Humbly making our requests known to God. God, will you please in a situation that seems very uncertain to us, We ask you to be merciful, that the death toll would go down, that healing would increase, there'd be wisdom. God, we're making our requests humbly to you in a situation that could cultivate a lot of anxiety. But then Paul also says, pray in everything, pray humbly asking, and pray with thanksgiving. He says, we must also pray with thankfulness. Being thankful for what? Well, it could be anything about who God is or what he has done towards us But Paul's already given us two ideas of things we can be thankful for even as we pray. Paul, even as he sat there in prison, could be praying and saying, God, thank you that even as I sit in this prison cell, humbly asking that I could be released, God, I can still rejoice and have joy because of who you are. Thank you that I can have joy in this prison cell. Paul could also say, God, thank you that I can have a testimony of reasonableness. As he sat in prison unjustly, he was not acting unjust or harsh or unreasonable toward, even towards those that were imprisoning him. How did he act? Lovingly, kind, peaceable, gentle. Sound familiar? Fruit of the Spirit stuff. That's what Paul was doing. And he could do that because he knew, my Lord's at hand. If I'm not freed from this physical prison cell, freedom's coming for me. This is not the end. Therefore, I can act in reasonableness. God, thank you that I can have a testimony of reasonableness because I know who you are and that you are at hand. God, thank you for that. If we want to walk in peace, if we want to have a calmness of the soul, it requires that we put off anxiousness but replace it with something else as we put on prayer that is honest to our God about our requests but is also thankful to our God regardless of our circumstances. If you want to walk in peace instead of anxiousness, that's what putting that off and then putting on prayer looks like. But now we get to verse seven, to point number four this morning. Peace requires position. We get to the first point in this set of verses where Paul explicitly mentions peace. He says, rejoice, be reasonable, because the Lord is at hand. And he says, in place of anxiety and anxiousness, pray. And then he says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
I want to break this down into a couple of sections here, this particular verse or sentence. He starts by saying the peace of God. This doesn't say the peace of the world, the peace of humanity. This is a very specific kind of peace. This is the peace of God, and that's something distinct and different. John chapter 14 and verse 20, Jesus is talking and he says in verse 27, says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He's saying, I am giving you my peace, which is different than the world's version of peace, which is so closely tied to their circumstances. He's saying, my peace is different. My peace is distinct. This is a God-centered, God-focused, and God-sustained kind of peace that comes only from him. This peace of God is greater than our current trials and sufferings. This peace of God says, passes all understanding. This peace of God has eternity in view. This peace of God is about knowing and delighting in God himself. It is a God-focused and God-sustained calmness in our soul. That's a different kind of peace. But then it says, what will this kind of peace do? He says, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Paul is saying that this peace of God will guard your inner self. Guard it from what? From the lack of inner peace, which comes from not focusing on or being sustained by God. The lack of inner peace from not focusing on or being sustained by God. God's peace helps guard us from that. God's kind of peace guards us from the distress in our souls when the experience in front of us seems uncertain and we don't know how it will turn out. But this last phrase is where I want you to pay really special attention because everything we've said so far actually hinges on this, on these three words, in Christ Jesus. It says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Why is it possible to rejoice always? Why is it possible to be reasonable as Paul calls us to? Why is it possible to not be anxious? Why is any of that possible? It's only possible if we are in Christ Jesus. Knowing the peace of God that is only possible if our position is one in union with Christ himself. What does that have to do with our peace for us to be people who experience the peace of God, for peace to guard our hearts and minds, God had to bring peace to us first. Everyone in this world is born not knowing, not experiencing, not living in the peace of God. This is because we all naturally want to do things our way instead of God's way. The Bible calls this sin. And therefore, in our sin, we seek to find peace on our own. And in doing so, we've created by our sin this conflict between us and God himself. Sin breaks the peace between us and God. And that conflict is only resolved and peace is only brought to sinners like us when God is the one who brings it to us. Romans chapter five and verse two says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Our sin against God deserves just and right consequences from him, but Jesus came to take the consequences that sinners like us deserve so that he could be our person of peace, so that he could bring peace to us that we could never bring to ourselves. The only reason we can do all of these things Paul calls us to, experience these things, live them out, and have the peace of God as a calmness in our soul is because of the peace that the ultimate peacemaker, Jesus, brings to sinners like us. When we turn away from our sin and seeking peace through anything else but Christ, then we are united with Christ. We are positionally placed in him. That's our new position. Not in conflict with God, but in the Son, in union with Christ, experiencing the peace of the Godhead. 
when this happens, when we are joined in Christ, we are given peace by God himself. A peace that makes it possible to rejoice in all circumstances. A peace that makes it reasonable to be fair, mild, and gentle always. A peace that makes it possible to put off anxiousness as we thank God for the transcendent peace he's already brought to us in Christ. In Christ Jesus and in him alone, we have a peace that guards our hearts and our minds. Everything this verse says is true, good, and possible. And it's really, really hard. That's why Paul says what he does in the last few verses of this section, point five this morning. Peace requires practice. Peace requires practice. In two ways that we're gonna look at in these verses, practice by thinking and practice by doing. Paul then says, here are some things that I want you to think on. And he lists them out. He says, think on what's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, or worthy of praise. Now, while these words can and do describe some things that we see in our world or even coming out of God's people as they live life for his glory, this list is most understood and most true when we look at it in light of its perfection. Who or what is most true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. It's God himself. If you want to practice living in the peace of God, start by gazing upon, thinking upon God himself. God, you are all of these things in this list. And taking actual time to think about how God is true, about how he is honorable and just and pure and lovely, how you know it and how you've seen it even in your own life as a follower of Christ. Think on these things. Gaze upon the perfect goodness of God as it demonstrates all these things that Paul lists here and tells us to practice, to think on. Christian, if you want to practice walking in peace, practice regularly thinking about God especially as it relates to these things that Paul tells us to dwell on. But then he also says to practice by doing. He talks about practice by thinking and now practice by doing. He says to the Christians that he's writing to, whatever you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me, practice these things, do these things. Paul is not saying here that he thinks he's perfect. He is saying, follow me as I follow Christ. He believed he was an example worthy of following. And so he says, the things that I've taught you, that I've explained to you, that I've demonstrated to you, that I've said to you, that you've seen in my life, follow me, practice these things. This is what Paul says. He says, as you do these things, you've seen in me what it looks like. I've demonstrated to you what it looks like to live in the peace of God even in the most trying of circumstances. Remember, he's writing these things as he sits in prison. And he's still saying, rejoice, be reasonable, don't be anxious. If there was somebody, we'd go, I understand why they're not rejoicing. (laughs) I understand they're a little unreasonable right now. I understand they seem a little worrisome or anxious. It's Paul, right? Like he is imprisoned, facing dire consequence for preaching the gospel of Jesus. Yet he goes, no, that's not what I'm doing nor what you should do because it's not how you walk in peace. Saying, you've seen me demonstrate this. Follow the example that I've set. And as he does this, he says, you will experience and walk in and have the God of peace with you. How can Paul be so certain about this? How can Paul be so certain that if we will gaze upon God and if we will follow the example and the pattern that he has set here, that we will experience this God of peace. How is he so certain that if we will rejoice and be reasonable and pray instead of being anxious, we will experience peace through the God of peace. How can Paul be so confident that that's going to happen if we do these things? He's sure because doing these things does not create peace what it does is help us see the God of peace and the gift of peace that as Christians we already have. 
None of these things that he mentions create something new. Remember, he's writing to Christians. Christians who have had God, who is peace, bring peace to them. Christians who have experienced the peace of God, it's been applied to their hearts by the Holy Spirit, by the, through the work of Christ. They already have it. It's already there. That's why Paul can confidently say, if you do these things, what does it do? It reminds you of the God of peace that you already know and the peace he's already given to you. You've just forgotten. You're just not seeing it right now. But these things will help you see what you already have, believer. You have the peace of God, believer. The God of peace is with you, believer. And these things will help you see and remember that, that you may live and walk in the peace of God that you already have because he graciously gave it to you. That's why Paul can be confident that believers can have a God-focused and God-sustained calmness of the soul because it really isn't about them creating any kind of peace for themselves. It's about the God of peace who has already brought peace to them. I want us to think about this kind of conclusion and application idea today, and it's this. Peace does not come from guarding the thing we're terrified to lose. Peace comes from believing that in Christ, we have already gained that which cannot be lost. So often, even as Christians, we try to make our own peace. We try to find, create, and sustain peace for ourselves. And we do it often by finding something in our life, and we believe that if we can simply retain and protect that thing, then we'll have peace. We can find that in a relationship, a job, an opinion of someone else, a status or title, or a circumstance, but we become willing to try to find peace in that thing and we will protect it at any cost. So we think, if I can just hang on to this, if this is okay, then I'll be okay. We fight and we fight and we fight to protect it. And you know what happens? We either figure out over time that thing can't actually bring the depth of peace that our soul needs. Or we lose that thing and now falsely believe that our peace is gone and we can't ever get it back. That's what happens when we try to make peace, find peace, protect peace for ourselves that's not what God intends for us. That's not what it looks like to have the peace of God in us. Peace doesn't come from you and I protecting something we're terrified to lose. Peace comes from us seeing and believing that in Christ, we already have, we've already been given a peace which can't be lost. Friends, you don't guard peace. Peace guards you. You do not guard peace. The peace of God guards you. When you know the God who is peace because he has brought peace to you, when you dwell on that, that he is the one who has done it and accomplished it, when you realize that peace is your protection because it can't be taken away, that's when you start experiencing and living in the peace of God. That's when your soul knows a calmness that it never has before. It knows it and experiences it when you stop trying to guard peace for yourself. And know that it's always been the intention of God that he and his peace is what guards you. In that peace, let your soul find a calmness and a rest that you have never experienced before. This morning, we're gonna have one of our members come and pray for us in regards to us understanding, believing, and living out what it looks like to know this God of peace and to live as people of peace. And so I'm gonna invite Christiane, if she would, to come with this time, and she's gonna pray for us as we think on the idea of peace from Philippians 4 this morning. Dear, dear Heavenly Father, God, we just humbly come before you, and we just thank you that you are the God of peace, and that when this world is falling apart and there's so much hard and scary things going on that we can just rest in you. Lord, I pray that you would help us this week to just rejoice in the Lord, not in our circumstances, um, but just to rejoice in you, God. And thank you that 
you are coming back and that you are going to right all the wrongs and that we can just rest in that and we don't have to fight to make it all right. We can just trust that you are going to do that one day, God. And I just pray that you would just um, help us to come to you with all of our anxiety, all our fears, all our worries, and to present those to you, God, and just be thankful for what you've already done and how you will answer these things, God, and that we can just keep our minds and our hearts focused on you and that we would just experience the peace that you've already given us through Jesus, Lord. And I pray that as we walk in peace, that it would just be a light to the lost and that it would draw people to you, God. We love you and we thank you for just the hope that we have because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to have a time of response as we've heard God's truth from his word today. And this will actually look a little different than it has for the past few months. Um, today, we are actually going to resume group singing as a church, something we had done last summer and fall. And then as COVID conditions work, uh, worsened, and as we consulted with our, the building owners here that we rent from, for a time, we've paused group singing but we're actually going to resume that today. And what we're asking is that during this time, when it's time to sing, that you would wear a mask while we sing. If you don't have one or you need one, there will be time in just a few minutes. There's some available in the back and someone can help you get one. So during this time of response, one of the things we'll be doing is joining in singing together. But we're also gonna have time for you to reflect on and think on the things that you have heard in this message today and also time for you, if you're a Christian, to come to the communion table, to participate at the communion table. And I want us to think about this for a moment before I pray and before we just take time for reflection and singing and communion. I wanna think about what this table reminds us of in connection to peace. I titled this message, The Person of Peace. If you want to be someone, you'd say that I am a person of peace, meaning I have peace in me, and I'm living as a person of peace, you have to know the person of peace, and that's Jesus Christ. This table reminds us the cup of Jesus' blood and his body represented by the bread of what Christ did for us as he died in our place, as he died for sinners like us on the cross. That was the, what was necessary to make peace between us and God that God himself would absorb the justice that we deserve as Christ took on the consequences that we rightfully deserve, that peace could be made, that we could know the peace that we talked about this morning. Without the person and work of Jesus, we don't know peace. Not the kind of peace that's eternal, that reaches into the depths of our soul. We don't know that peace without the peacemaker, Jesus Christ. So Christian, today, I would encourage you, when you come to the table, when you're ready, think on your peacemaker, Jesus Christ. Think about what he did to bring you peace, a peace you could never create or find on your own. And then rejoice in your peacemaker. Rejoice in the peace he has brought you. So you don't have to go find it. You don't have to sustain it yourself. You don't have to guard it but the peace that you have through Jesus Christ, that it guards you. I'm gonna pray for us. After I do that, I'll invite our musicians and media team to come to the table first when they're ready. And we'll take just a few minutes. You'll hear the musicians playing in the background for a few minutes to give you time just to think and pray. But Christian, whenever you're ready during that time or when we stand to sing, when you're ready to come to the communion table, you can do so one or two at a time. But let me just pray for us this morning as we enter into this time of just worship and response. God, I thank you so much that when we were the peace breakers, that you sent the perfect peacemaker, Father, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to make and bring peace for us. Father, our, our souls did not know 
calmness and peace outside of you. God, our souls were just left in unrest and anxiety in an eternal sense until you brought a calmness and peace to us, until you restored the relationship through Jesus Christ. God, I thank you so much that in in your love that you sent Christ. Jesus, thank you that in your love, you died for us. Holy Spirit, thank you that you stir up in us a love for God and a knowing of this peace that's brought to us in Christ. God, I pray that individually and as a church, we would be a people of peace, not because we have created this for ourselves, but because we see the great gift that you have provided for us. And we would simply learn by the truth of your word and the power of your spirit to walk in, to live in the peace that you have brought to us. God, I pray that your spirit will work in us in this time, just reminding us of areas, convicting us in areas where we haven't been living as people of peace. We've been ignoring your peace. God, in this time, give us um, just wisdom on how we need to repent and change and grow. God, I pray that we would just worship you well in this time together corporately. And above all, we would just be made more like your son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen.
like to invite all of you to stand as we sing. Let God-focused and God-sustained peace be in our hearts as we sing to Him. the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morning, since there are many, His mercy is more. Verse 3. Riches of kindness he lavished on us His blood was the payment, his life was the cost We stood near the death we could never afford But since they are many, his mercy is more Praise the Lord Praise the Lord is more stronger than darkness you every more since they are many his mercy is more what love could bring no wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into a sea With a bottom or shore Since they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more Mercy is more stronger than darkness, new every morn. Since they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, oh, his mercy is more. sing to the Lord for who He is. Like you, there is no other. 
true delight is found in you alone. Your grace, a well too deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heavens free. Your truth has found a perfect wisdom. My highest Savior of my ruined life, my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders. In my place, you suffer, bled, and died. You rose the grave and death the conquer. You brought my bonds of sin and shame. You rose the grave and death the conquer. You broke my bonds of sin and shame. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, may all my days bring glory to Thank you that you are our rock and redeemer. You are our sword, our shield, our refuge. In our sinfulness, in our weakness, in our frailty, you are our strong tower, our place of peace, our refuge. God, may we this week realize the goodness and the rest and the calmness of soul that comes from seeing and walking in light of you being our peace and our protector. God, I pray that we will see you as our peace, as our peacemaker, and that because of that, because you have provided it for us, we will walk this week with a calmness of soul that is focused and sustained by you alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Our benediction verse for this morning is from John 16, 33, which reads, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We pray that you know this peace of Jesus. We pray that as you go this week that you would go in the love and the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ. Thank you for worshiping with us together this morning. You're dismissed.